that we have probabilities. Where we spend our time is either a high or low probability. Everything has a range. And so there's five different ways to get business. And at the top of this list are those that have the highest likelihood of a favorable outcome. And so path number one, people who have bought from you in the past, people who have done business with you, that is an area that obviously has the highest likelihood of getting you more opportunities. They purchased from you. You have a story. They've hired people from you. You've sent them an invoice. They've paid you on time. What's not to love? The problem with that is that that's finite. We need to expand that. And the concept of business development, even though this is at an all time high, it's easy to get clients now, I think you should capitalize on that. You're not gonna make placements with every company that you do business with over and over again. You might do one or two here, but what you're doing is you're filling the funnel in terms of a client base, because at the end of, of day comes night. At the end of a good season comes a bad season. The one thing I can promise you is that things are going to get worse. We don't know when, we don't know how, but we know they're going to get worse. It will happen. And then I can promise you again that things are going to get better after that. We don't know when or how, and then on and up and down and so forth. And we never know when the next natural or man-made uh, disaster is going to change everything overnight. So this is a good time to harvest business relationships because people want to know who you are right now. They want to work with you right now because everybody's hiring. This is an optimal scenario on the direct hire slash executive recruiting side because everybody wants people. So number one, the highest likelihood of getting you a return is those that have done business with you. The second highest likelihood are those people that know you. People that you've talked with, maybe it's at some sort of a business function, maybe you presented candidates to them but they didn't hire your person. But you know what? You still have a relationship with them, don't you? People that know you. It's not cold. There's history. They just haven't hired anybody from you. But that means you have an open door. When you look to build relationships with a wide swath of prospects, now when you're reaching back out to those people, it's not doing it cold. And then the third path are obviously referrals. Referrals, as you know, it's the lifeblood of selling. When's the best time to get a referral from someone at the point that their value that they see in you and from you is at its highest? That's when it's a good time, whenever you make a placement or whenever you talk to your client and your client says, boy, Sherry is doing fantastic. She's the best controller we've hired. Thank you, I appreciate that. I thought that she was great also. I'm really glad it's working out. I'm curious, who are some other companies that you know of are going through change right now. Who are some friends of yours in business that have those sorts of accounting and finance needs where you think I might be able to help? That's an easy way to get business, referrals. The fourth path are people that have heard of you. They've heard of Pride Staff. They've heard of your recruiting division. They've read an article that one of your colleagues wrote. They've heard of you. And then the fifth path, obviously, what's left? It's cold. Those people that have never done business with you, they don't know who you are. There's never been a referral. There's no connected relationship and they don't even know who you are. You're just another headhunter that's calling them. And that obviously is the least likelihood of getting business. So where do you think most people spend most of their time in doing business development and cold calls? It doesn't make any sense, but well, I'm going to make a list of everybody and I'm going to call. Them. And I'll tell you this, that cold calling, it's the least likelihood of getting a successful outcome. At the top of the list, you have higher odds at the bottom, you have lower odds. So why spend time in that area? Now there are two exceptions. When you cold call, one of them is if you are doing some sort of research on, let's say it's an article that you're writing for a newsletter, or you want to write an article and you want to get that submitted to a trade association. There was someone, because I don't do coaching anymore, but there was someone that coached me to help him get started. And he was doing healthcare recruiting in Nashville, Tennessee, a pretty good place to do healthcare recruiting. He'd done some temporary staffing, but he'd never done executive search before. 
So we came up with some talking points for articles that he would write. And the first thing I recommended that he do, instead of calling clients and saying, hey, I'm in business, never placed anybody in the hospital organizations before, and I'm here to save the day. No, instead of doing that, I said the first call you should do is to the executive director of the Tennessee chapter of the American Healthcare Association. Tell her that you do, uh, you recruit within her niche and you'd like to write an article on whatever, fill in the blank, best practices of leadership, interviewing high performing employees, client or employee retention, employee loyalty. And she said, yes, we'd love to have an article. And then he said, who are some of your board members that you would love to see get some press? Because I'd like to interview them and I'd be happy to quote them on things that they tell me about this topic. And so she referred him to three CFOs of big hospital organizations. And guess what? He started his niche calling people that were referred from somebody that was within their industry as a credentialed expert, somebody that was in the know, the, the social director for the cruise line that knows everybody's business, that's a trade association executive. And she was able to refer him to high level CFOs. So his entry point coming into a brand new niche was very strong because he didn't start off calling people that had never hired anybody from him, that didn't know him, that didn't have any connection and had never heard of him. He, he didn't start off cold. So I want you to think of this and I got, I've got some specific ideas here. And, I, and so what I want you to do, I want you to think of number one, write this down. Who are your top 10 existing clients that you have? Now there's an author, his name is Ed Wallace, uh, wrote several books on business development. And the one that I think is probably the best one that I've read is called Business Relationships That Last. And if you go onto my, uh, onto my podcast, you'll see that he's on he's on that uh, he's on that uh, he's on there twice I'm gonna... and one of the things I like about Ed is that he's got a very practical approach of building business relationships and he says identify the fab five who are those five people that you want to have some sort of connection with and you want to build a closer relationship to who are they? And then write down what action steps are you going to take to grow closer to them? Success doesn't happen by chance. It's never accidental. But that idea of identifying who are the top five individuals within your client relationships, number one, number two. And so what I've done, I've gotten real clear on that this year. And there's actually one firm that has multiple executives. I've got the chairman, and then I've got the new recruiting director, and then hallelujah, the new recruiting director, she referred me to three of their key executives, two of which live here in Richmond. And I got real clear on what I wanna do. I'm gonna have a meeting with the chairman. I've had multiple meetings with the new recruiting director. She referred me to the three of the, uh, what they call the deputy managing directors or managing partners, two of which are in Richmond. And about 30 minutes ago, both of them said, yes, we'd love to meet you for a happy hour on the 29th or the 30th. And so I got real clear and real intentional. I've been doing this since the dawn of time. I've been in this business longer than some of you've been alive, I promise you. And I still keep it at a very C-spot run level. I keep it very simple, very deliberate, and very intentional. And when you identify who are those top five individuals that you want to grow close to, now it's on your mind. You're gonna think of them when you read an article that you could forward to them. And you don't wanna hound them, you don't wanna wear your welcome out, obviously. A lot of this is delicate nuance. But who are those fab five that Ed talks about in his book? So I'd recommend not just the fab five, but who are the top 10 clients? You wanna be very strategic about this. I would say that as you build your life funnel of your book of business, probably, let's say out of 
10 organizations. Let's say if you make, you have 10 clients that you make placements in over the course of the year, probably about two or three of those are going to be about 60% of your business. You're going to have two or three of those that are going to be about 60%. There's going to be about another two or three that are probably going to be about another 20% of your business. And then everybody else, about another six, are probably going to do one or two placements a year. It's the 80-20 rule. And there's a book on the 80-20 rule called The One Thing. I don't know if you've, any of you guys have ever read that. Uh, it's fantastic. There's actually a podcast called The One Thing where they take the concept of the book. 80% of your business comes from 20% of your clients. So focus on that 20% of your clients. You still have to get other business, and I'll kind of talk about that in a second. But those, those core clients that you have, who are those executives that you can meet that you haven't met yet? You don't ever want to have a really good client with just one point of contact in there. Why is that? But well, you know, that person can leave. They could go to another company. Well, yeah, you might follow them but you don't want to lose this existing client that you have. So the concept of business development that I teach, and I really believe this, is three things. You want to get more business. It's always a good time to get more business. But everybody's hiring. Yes, that's a good reason to continue growing the number of clients that are working, that you're working with. And then the next one is better business. Better business. What do I mean by that? People that pay you on time or early. If anybody here had a client that goes out of the way to pay them early, raise your hand. You guys ever have that happen? It's fantastic. You know what? They need you more than you need them. I don't know if you guys have figured that out yet, especially right now. They need you more than you need them. More business, better business, companies that pay you on time or early. Companies that ask you, what do you think we should do? They ask for your input on their searches, even on their strategy, on their employee retention. They ask you for input. When you have companies that are asking for your input, now you know you're making headway in the quality of that relationship. When they're seeking you out for your advice, when they're having a board meeting and they're mentioning your name, we're looking at our strategy and because you've placed so many people within our company, we thought it would be good for our board to know that we're working with you to help us grow. That's exciting. You're making a difference. You ever had a slow paying client? Raise your hand, right? Yeah, I've had them, but you know what? When you have enough business, more business, better business, there's nothing wrong with getting rid of the bottom 15% every year. There's nothing wrong with that. When you look at your client roster, who are the ones that are causing me the most heartache? I don't need them because I've replaced them. And then eventually all the business. That means that if it's a small organization, you're the only recruiter they're going to work with. If it's a larger organization, you're going to be the first one that they think of. How do you know when you're making this progress? When you have a leader of the executive team and many of the organizations we work with now have internal recruiters. Some of those people used to do what we do so they know how hard it is and you make that person look good. That person is going to introduce you to the leadership. That's why I used to think that HR stood for human roadblocks. My philosophy has changed over the years because these are people that have a personal agenda and they will go out of their way to keep a good person from getting hired if it makes them look bad through a recruiter that they don't like. They will do what is not in their company's best interest, but in their own interests, because everybody wants to look good. It's just the way human nature is. So anytime you have a new relationship with someone that's in HR or an internal recruiter, you want to let them know. Some of my best clients, I've collaborated with the HR team. I've actually made them look really good through some of the people that I've brought them. Ding, 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 ding. Now you've got my attention, okay? It's just the way people are. And this goes back to the first cardinal rule of human behavior. That people are going to do what's in their own best interests. That's it. They will put their own agenda over their organization's agenda. I promise you that. So you want to go through your client roster. Who are your top 10 clients? And then identify who are those executives within those top 10 clients? Who are five individuals within those top 10 that you want to grow closer to? 
and I'd recommend writing it down. What are the action steps that you want to take to grow closer to these people? Things you can do. You could say, let's let's meet. Now that uh, COVID is a lot more, we're adapting to it, and I never want to say it's over. <laughs> I don't want to jinx it. I don't ever say, oh, now that COVID's over, oh, darn you, July 2022, 2021, just like last year. No, don't ever say it's over. Now that things are getting better and people are meeting, I thought it might be great for you and me and one of my colleagues to come to your office and say hello, maybe a cup of coffee or a meal or happy hour. They would love that. And if they agree to that, now you know you're getting somewhere in that relationship. Next best thing, obviously, is a Zoom or a Teams call, a video meeting. Other things you can do. Here's an article that one of my colleagues wrote on employee loyalty. I thought you'd find this interesting. Here's an article that I wrote on employee loyalty. I thought you might find this interesting, which is even better. Even if you're brand new, you want to start thinking about your own personal brand within this industry. And you do that by getting published, by writing articles, by seeking out to be a guest on certain podcasts within your industry, things like that. Then you can send it to your client. Wow, they think you're a big deal. Every other headhunter out there, they're not doing this stuff. You're in the business of professional services. And this is what professionals do to raise their profile. So there's top 10 clients. How can you grow close to them? Uh, the next action step is, who are 20 people that you know? Just make a list, brainstorm. These can be candidates, these can be clients. Who are 20 people that you know that are influential within the industry? And I would suggest reaching out to them, staying connected with them, connecting with them on LinkedIn at some appropriate time. And I, I think it's good to try to uh, serve them. Is there, let me know if there's anything I can do. For you. It's a busy time and I'm coming across a lot of great opportunities, not just in terms of people that I place, but I'm well connected. And if there's anything I can do for you, please let me know. And perhaps there might be some opportunities and change. Well, sure, what can I do for you? Well, if you ever know any companies that are going through change within my niche, accounting and finance or whatever it is, please keep me posted. Everybody's hiring right now. It'll be easy to get business this way. One other reason, well, gosh, why should I do this when I'm covered up with work? Well, a lot of it depends on where you're at in terms of your fees. If you're not charging 30% fees, Full fees for those, if you're not charging retainers, and we're going to talk about that later on in our sessions, then you still have some bandwidth to fill up. You want to be, you will be completely full when you have 10 to 20 organizations paying you retainers for searches at full 30% fees. That's when you can stop doing business development because there's always ways to grow. A 30% fee, that's not unheard of within the industry. 25 is pretty good. 20, eh, you know, keep raising it. If you're not, if you're definitely at 20, then you need more business. The reason why that is you get a new search. Let's say you're at 20% fees, your new client, we've got a critical need. What steps have you taken so far to fill the position? On a scale of one to 10, 10 meaning it's critical. What range are you in terms of needing to fill that? It's an 11. So does that mean I should clear my desk off of my existing clients and make you my top priority? Yes, would you do that for us? Well, absolutely, but it really depends. The, the way I work is I charge a one-time fee of 30% of first year's compensation. And if you're okay with that, I can make you my priority and drop everything else. Uh, it's not that big of a deal. Or would you really do that for us? Yes, hallelujah, you got a new one at a good fee because whoever needs it the least always wins. Because you've got 10 other companies that are screaming for talent. And here's a new one, you can say no to them. You can negotiate down if you need to, uh, to a lower fee, but okay, this is what I'm gonna do. I'll, I'll work it at a 27% fee. But then you can negotiate a working relationship. Anytime I leave a message, I want you to call me back that day. I'll lower my fee in exchange for responsiveness and you gotta pay me on time. Okay, that sounds great. Boom. And that's why we do this. Your bandwidth will be completely filled up when you're billing a million dollars a year at 30% fees with 10 to 20 companies where you're even charging some retainers. That's when you can stop getting more business, okay? <laughs> that's when you can stop. 
more business, better business, all the business. Review of number two, 20 people that you know. Who are them? Who are some companies that you know are going through change? Number three, when you look at getting referrals, who are those people that are most likely to refer business to you? And I've got a couple of about five ideas right here. And let me ask you this, who's gotten a referral to a new client within the last 30 days? Anybody get a referral? Sarah, great, Shari, perfect, good. And Sarah, can I ask you, can you unmute yourself? Tell us about that story. How did you get that referral? The majority of the ones that we've gotten recently have been past clients referring us to other departments or people we haven't worked with. So it, it falls back on what you were sharing about people that have used us before that have a trusted relationship with us. And a lot of times they're not referring them because they know about our client referral program, which is even more fun because after they refer them, then we get to educate them on the client referral program and say, well, we filled it. Now we get to also say thank you with a donation to your favorite charity or cause. So That's great. we've had two of those in the last 30 days and a third one um, will pay out as well. So in the last 90 days, we've had three, I guess, that have been client referral program contributions. That's great. That's fantastic. And oh, and uh, and so when you asked for the referral, what was the, the person? Was this the owner of the company and executive? What was their role? No, a lot of times it's not even asking, Scott, and I, and I don't mean that from a, I mean, it's providing a relationship that is such a trustworthy relationship that they want someone to have the same experience with you that they have. And so a lot of times it's not asking for business, it's just validating your partnership with them and, and allowing them to want to refer people to you. That's so great. it's people coming to them and asking for it. That's fantastic. And I really like that referral, uh, the, the, the referral bonus thing that you have, the contribution because I think that is much more attractive to professionals, business owners, people that aren't having their check their bank account balances every day. You know, they like that. When I can refer someone to you and X number of dollars goes to a charity, that's fantastic because it's selfless. And selflessness is very attractive to people. Uh, and it bonds them to you. So good job on that. I'm so proud of you, Sarah. That's great. Good job. So who are most likely to refer us think of it like this your most recent placement and you've got two people you can refer get referrals from a client and a candidate your most recent placement now you want to make sure that the ink dries on the invoice that you send out and you got paid for it and everybody's there and there's nothing weird going on because you know how it is you got some placements where you're like i don't want to know you know just pay me the fee and we're not going to talk anymore because it's pretty weird some things get pretty weird, but one that isn't weird, call them. I wanted to ask you help. Sure, what can I do for you? My goal is to find two more organizations just like yours that I can help. Who are some companies that you know are going through change right now? Who are some friends of yours that are executives with other organizations? Who are some friends you have in various trade associations? And then even the candidate. Congratulations, I'm so glad it's working for you. I'm curious, my goal is to get uh, several more organizations that I can help, similar to XYZ Company, which is a great company. Who are some other companies that you've heard are looking to grow right now? Because you know what? They're getting calls. They're still getting calls from other headhunters about other opportunities. You can find out who those organizations are. They may have said, well, you know what? I didn't tell you this, or maybe you even knew about it. I interviewed with two other companies that made me an offer, but I, an offer, but I turned it down but I've still got goodwill over there. I'd be happy to refer you to those organizations. You can actually get a couple of easy referrals. Who did you interview over there? We'll call John Smith. He's a director of human resources, a director of accounting, whatever. You call him and you mention this person's name. I know that you didn't hire him and were not successful. I actually did place him with another company, but he spoke highly of your organization. He said it was a very difficult decision and he thought enough of you to have me connect with you, I might be able to help you with some of those open positions that you have. It's something that you can get a lot more direct referrals to. In fact, there are candidates that you know that you're pretty cozy with, that you've got good friendships with, that you might be able to ask them, who are some other opportunities you're getting calls about right now? What are some other organizations you've interviewed with, but you didn't go there, they, went, they didn't hire you? You can use your active candidate base, especially those people where you've made some recent placements as a way 
as a way to get opportunities uh, that you get referrals. So that's your first one, your most recent place. And there's probably about, probably about three or four referrals right out of that, just right out of that step number one. Number two, who are those people that are benefiting the most in the placement? Who are those candidates that you placed within the last two years that are doing really well because of you? And isn't it great to work in an industry where we don't have to be ashamed with what we do, we can hold our head high and we know that we made that happen. And we are the ones that created that introduction, that we're able to help that company and also that individual out. And who are those individuals that truly benefit? I'd be willing to bet if you look over the last couple of years of placements that you've made, there's probably about three or four candidates that are so grateful that you came into their lives. And you can call them. I wanted to ask for your help. Sure, anything. What can I do? Ask them the same thing. Here's another one. Who is your most grateful client? Who is that one organization that is really benefiting from you? And I've, I've got some, uh, I, over the years, there was one organization where uh, their director of human resources, who eventually kept getting promoted, this is a large national contractor when I worked in construction years ago, that was when I realized that they need us more than we need them. It got to be where he would have a new search and he would refer me to the executive over that. I call John Smith, he runs that office. I'm gonna send him an email introduction. And then when it comes time to make the offer, get back to me and I'll work with you on drafting the offer. And that's truly a good sign when you have earned that trust of those types of executives. They depend on you. They're not embarrassing you. You're making them look good. You're not, there's never anything weird. And they can be a good referral source. Relationships like that. One thing I'm going to say is that we all make mistakes. And if you ever make a mistake with a client, you want to tell them, I goofed on this. I made a mistake. I got the time wrong or whatever the issue is. And then have a solution ready to go. You never want to lie. You never want to embellish. And I know I don't have to say that, but you never want to try to cover yourself up. You want to be honest because guess what? They know that they can trust you. That's the element of good business and good business development is to always be honest with things like that. So we've got who are those people that are most likely to refer? Your recent placements, who's benefiting the most in those placements, which candidates, who is the most grateful client that you have? And then who is your closest friend candidate? You could have candidates that you've talked with from time to time. And I've got some friend candidates, people I'm friendly with that are never gonna leave. And I, I call them to get referrals. I call them, and there's this one guy, anytime I don't feel like picking up the phone, I call Tom. Oh, Haley, looks like you've got a bad catitude. <laughs> <laughs> the joys of working at home, right? So anytime I just don't feel like making calls, who's that one person that you can reach out to? I'll call Tom. Tom, how are you? It's I'm doing great, Scott. I still don't want to move. That's okay. I just wanted to hear your voice. Because it's nice to be reminded that people actually want to talk to me. Yay, we all have those days. I don't want to make calls, so I'll call Tom. And Tom is always good for our folks. He's always good. What's the scoop, Scott? What are you hearing out there? Oh, I'm hearing such and such is gonna go under. I'm hearing this other firm's losing a lot of people. Oh yeah, I'm hearing that too. He's always gonna refer me to people. Who are some organizations that you know are going through change right now? I might be able to help out. That person will give you referrals, I promise you that. And then who is your closest friend client? Who's the one that is a client that is your buddy? And I always joke with my wife, and I've got one client that fits this test, and it's what I call the 2 a.m. Uh, bail me out of jail without telling anybody and not asking any questions test. That's my guy, but I still wouldn't ask him to bail me out of jail at 2 a.m. without any asking questions. Not like I'm gonna do anything to where I'd have to get bailed out of jail at 2 a.m., but that's, that's how I describe it. Who is the one that's almost to that point? I'm never gonna do that with a client, obviously, but who is my closest friend? And that's the thing with the client friends that we have, they are still clients. We don't want to tell them about all the problems that we're going through. It still is a friendship, it's still professional. But who is your, somebody that's almost up to that point, who is your closest friend client? Someone that if you're in a bind and you say, listen, I'm in a bind, my sales are kind of down, 
what are some priority searches you have where if I make placements, you can pay me quickly on those. It's that kind of client. And there are clients out there like, I'm in a bind, I really need some help. What are some opportunities you have where I can work on these and you can pay me quickly? Oh, I've got two or three searches. You know what, I'll, I'll help you out. I won't give them to anybody else. I'll work with you exclusively. And so those are our client friends. We always want to keep it professional. We always want to do that. I used to be a sailor and I've cleaned up my language and I've got some clients that cuss like sailors and I still don't cuss in front of them. We always want to keep it professional. But those are the kind of friends that I'm talking about. And then here's another tip. So we talked about your 10 existing clients, your 20 people that you know, who are those who are most likely to refer opportunities to you. And number four is call all the candidates that you've placed. Think of all the people that you've ever placed. That can be a pretty big list if you've been doing this for a few years. I think it's always good to reach out to people. And I had a, a, a person that I placed that just retired and we've been connected on LinkedIn. And I don't mean call, you can message them on LinkedIn. LinkedIn. You can reach out to them. If it's a phone call, that's great. Some people, they're just not into it. I think it's always good to do that, but at the very least, connecting with them. I thought of you the other day, and I hope everything's going well. They'll respond to you. You don't want to start off with, I hope everything's going well. By the way, can you help a brother out with a referral? No, don't start with that. I thought of you the other day. I hope you're doing well. And that's all you need to say. They'll respond to you. I'm doing well. How are you? Things are great. It's a record time. Uh, uh, and of course, if you place them, you don't want to take people out. You don't want to float that idea, but it's a busy time. If you ever come across opportunities where I can help those companies out, please let me know. In fact, I have a goal to get two more clients. So if you've heard of anybody, I'd be happy to talk to you about that at some point. So you can call or reach out to all the candidates you've placed. And number five, and this is our last tip, and I wanted to open it up to some more in-depth Q&A today, talking about some of your client challenges and then even deal challenges. We can do that also. Look at those top 30 candidates that you have not placed that are friendly, and you can reach out to them for referrals. And even you might find some people where the timing is good now. This is something that we realized that I resurrected in the last four to five weeks, three deals that fell apart during COVID. COVID started two years ago. It seems like both two weeks ago and 20 years ago at the same time. It seems like yesterday and just so long ago. But the world changed at least six different times over the last two years. We've been through a lot of change and people's priorities change. The way they make decisions change both companies and candidates. I had one, I, I, and I think it's good, reconnect with clients. I'd say, let's reevaluate your strategy. Uh, one business development tool, not related to getting referrals, but just to staying top of mind with your clients. If you haven't had any sort of video meeting with them to talk about business, to talk about priorities, if it's been longer than six months, this is a good time to do that. And you can say, now that we're at the two-year point of COVID, the world has changed six different times. We haven't talked in a while. I thought it might be good for us to have a video meeting and talk about some of your priorities and your strategy. I promise you, they will love that. They will absolutely love that. And it's great when you get not just the person that owns the search, director of accounting, or if it's HR, but multiple people involved, even the owner of the company, one of the key executives, because you're now expanding that network within that organization. This is something I've been doing a lot of right now, and it's highly effective. I think they, they, they like the fact that you care about them. And get this, they know that you know things that they don't know, which is what their competitors' employees are thinking about all day, because we spend all day getting in their heads, talking to their competitors' employees. We know what motivates them. We know what those trends are. We know who's doing what. And so I think that many people in this industry don't give themselves enough credit for the value that we bring beyond the placement. And like I said, when they start asking you questions, well, what have you seen out there? Well, props to you. That means you're doing the right things. If you're not getting that, it could mean that you need to grow in your gravitas a little bit. And let me, let me talk about that in a second. Let me make a note to come back to that. 
So the world has changed six different times. I thought it might be good since we haven't talked in a while to, to meet and talk about your priorities. Do it over a Zoom meeting or if, if it's even better if you can meet in person. Get multiple people on that meeting. One thing you can do, if there are people that you presented to those companies within the last two years and the candidate said no, be prepared to talk about those individuals. So with this one company I did this with that really gave me this idea, there, were, there was one, two, three, was it three individuals? Yeah, three individuals that said no for various reasons. And as I told my client, I said, why don't I reach out to them? And sure enough, all three, they're all back on my, my, on my magical recruiting circus bus with that client. They're all three interested. And I thought, I'm going to do this with everybody now. So we had this campaign where we're going back. We're talking to everybody that interviewed over the last two years. We're reaching out to all of them. So it's a good way that you can find some opportunities. You know, it's really, and it's really exciting when you get some, I would say they're leverageable uh, opportunities like this, where you can move that ball so much farther off of that one call rather than reaching out to somebody cold. So that's why it's important to keep in touch with all the candidates that you talk with. Years ago, there was somebody that hired me to coach them on business development, and they, were, and they were completely dry. This is what I came up with. Call every company you've ever made a placement with. Call every candidate you've ever placed. And then all those candidates that interviewed that didn't get hired, go through your database and build that list. Stay in touch with them. And then all those 30 candidates that you haven't placed, that you're friendly with. What are some other companies you're hearing about? where you're getting calls about. They will tell you, who did you speak with? Oh, you interviewed, but you decided not to join. Well, I may have someone that they would be interested in. Who did you speak with over there? Now you've got a referral into a company. And then you can even ask those candidates, and this is more on the candidate side, who are some friends of yours that you know are looking? You can do it one of two ways with candidates. Who are some friends of yours? that you know are looking. So if you work within an industry and you work with everybody in that industry, who are some friends of yours that you know are looking? And the other one is, I've got a specific search. This is the criteria. 10 to 15 years of a controlling experience. Who do you know that fits that profile? Someone that probably isn't looking to make a move and someone that probably seems happy where they are. Who do you know that fits that profile? And get direct referrals to people that might not be actively looking at. And let me do this, let me kind of press pause. But one thing I wanted to share with you, the idea of gravitas. That means that you need to have strength when you're talking to strong leaders. You need to have, and it does. it's not a personality thing. You can be quiet, you can be an introvert and still have gravitas. But I'd say it's three things. One of them is understanding what business is all, of, all about, having a solid business acumen. And what I mean by that is getting educated. I don't have an MBA. The only time I've been in a business classroom is when I've been a guest lecturer there and that's it. But I read the Wall Street Journal and I talk to people. And if you read the Wall Street Journal every day, yeah, it's gonna cost you 36 bucks a month, but it's worth it. Read the Wall Street Journal every day. Read industry publications and blogs. Read those publications that focus on your niche. Or if you work at a geographic region, the business journal get to know those reporters pretty well. And if you ever see a reporter write a story where you could contribute, even though it's already been sent to press or been sent to print online, email that reporter and say, that was a very good article you wrote. If you ever do a follow-up piece, I would recommend suggesting these three points. Number one, number two, number three. And I remember once there was a publication, it was a Wall Street Journal, the editor wrote, an article that said companies don't like to hire ex-entrepreneurs. And I disagreed with that. And I wrote her, I said, I disagree with that. And here's why. And she said, those are great points. She wrote another article and quoted them. So now I can say I've been quoted in the Wall Street Journal. You only have to get quoted in the Wall Street Journal once to say you've been quoted in that or the business journals. So reach out to those reporters that are writing articles within your niche or in a geographic region, if you work like in multiple industries, but just one geographic region, and get to know them. And I promise you, they will come to you 
and they will be you will be a source for them for future content because they're always looking to grow people and if you seem like someone that's tightly plugged in to an industry do you sit on a trade association related to your niche are you involved with your company's governance or getting involved in making decisions if not that's okay but you can get involved in the chamber of commerce or things like that in a rotary group a way that shows that you're well connected that you're a board level person in terms of running organizations that they want to get involved in but that they want to they want to see that you're involved uh, other things related to gravitas that uh, and and don't take this the wrong way but you don't want to say thank you and i mean what i mean by that is this you want them to say thank you to you first any time i would meet with the client i want to put so much value in the meeting that as we walk out they're going to say thank you to me thank you for visiting us thank you for joining us today it was very helpful my pleasure i'm very excited about our relationship and i look forward to working together on this appreciate you making the time you want to be gracious about that and and let's it staff if it's a staff person a legal secretary whoever it is an administrative assistant i'm just going to i'm going to uh, lather it up with gratitude thank you so much for coordinating this meeting i'm definitely going to do that but if it's a high level person what they're looking for is are you subordinate or are you an equal if you're subordinate well thank you for your time mr jones well that's a low level vendor that's not a peer they want to deal with equals and it's a state of mind it doesn't have anything to do with the title so what i mean by that is you have a meeting you have a call you don't want to thank you for your time on the call you want them to thank you first So that's just one thing about gravitas. And the final thing I'll say about that is that you want to talk to a chairman of an international organization and an Uber driver or a cabbie on the same level. You don't want to talk down to people, you don't want to talk up to, up to people. They want to be on the same level. It's always first names. It's not Mr. or Miss, it's not Sir or Ma'am. It's John, Susan, equals, not Mr. Smith or Mrs. Jones. We're a peer level to them. That's really important. especially if you're young if you're younger if you're in your 20s it, you know they they might be older than your parents but you still want to treat them as an equal and with that let me kind of turn it over to you guys and see if anybody has any sort of situation or challenge or any question about what we've talked about or anything else related to some of your deals that you have right now i guess the ma- the main challenge is just time time to make this phone call i have all these searches going on i have all this calendar with interviews 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 i'm slammed right and i'm thinking where am i squeezing the follow ups where am i squeezing this conversation and i don't want to say okay even though i'm the one who reached out i got to go because you know I, you 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 want to be courteous you reached out to them but you're so squeezed so what do you suggest how to time manage do you, do you just square out the day or I mean, the phone doesn't stop ringing as you can just heard. <laughs> right. That's great, Shani. I think that's a good question. I would say make it a weekly habit. It doesn't have to be hours and hours. It could be 45 minutes a week. Friday afternoon from 2 to 3 o'clock. That's going to be your outbound connect calls. Uh, and you can call it what you want. You can call it outbound business development calls. So you can take a part of your time where you're not under the gun. It's in what I would usually do Friday at 4 o'clock. Oh. Uh, you know depending on where you're at in the life cycle of your development of your desk uh, where you know now sometimes i might leave a little early friday but i've earned that i'll set goals where i can do that if not hey i'm going to work here till 5 5:30 friday and i'm going to spend the last hour i'm just calling people i'm just calling people i connect with or messaging them on linkedin but i think in many ways and i know i mentioned on linkedin that's good but even a personal phone call is helpful for people to get to know you because they got you got a voicemail they're hearing your voice there. So I think if you set a goal every week, let's say from 4 to 5 on Friday afternoon, that's your outbound business development time. It's not going to feel like you're looking at your watch when you're making those. So that's what I'd recommend. And you can set certain rewards. Like if I talk to five people, then I'm done with that exercise and I'll probably do that again next week. So, oh. and this is something I'd say this type of approach is think of it like brushing your teeth. We could go two days without brushing our teeth, but we we will find the time to brush and floss. We will find the time to do that. 
and you just do a little bit every day. You could do a little bit every day or just once a week for an hour. I'm going to do outbound business development. So great question. For someone who's new to the recruiting industry, um, what would be some advice on how maybe like a baby step to start incorporating these different techniques? I would say to read a lot and start reaching out. So if you're brand new and Evelyn, how long have you been in the industry? Uh, nine months. Nine months. Okay. Uh, welcome to the industry. Thank you. Uh, and you're with a great company. You really are. I've met a lot. And this is one of my favorites. It probably is my favorite. Tammy's one of my favorite people in the whole industry. So I think I would, let me think for a second. I would read a lot. I would read industry publications. On social media, I would repost certain things that are thoughtful. And I would engage with people that were in positions of influence. And if you're brand new, people will want to help you. I don't think it's good to say I'm brand new. But they're going to know that they'll ask you how long you've been with the company. I've been here for about nine months. Uh, people will go out of the way to help you if you're new. Let me think if there's anything else. I would even start writing. I would recommend. And when I talk about writing and things like that, that doesn't mean between nine and five. That's early in the morning, at the end of the day, on the weekends. We don't want to take our prime business development time to do that. That's early in the morning when you wake up. I would recommend, I would suggest. What are some things that you want to learn more about within recruiting, whether it's objections that candidates have or counteroffers or things like that, and study that and just do some writing. That's what I'd recommend. Thank you. Great. Scott, I have a question. Um, I'm also new, um, just joined in November. Um, I have a couple of um, people in my network that are senior executives, C-suite. And um, I just wanted some advice of how to approach, um, you know, obviously I want to sort of add value and get some business from them, but what would you recommend? I would ask if it's someone, and do you, uh, do you have any candidates that you think they would be interested in hearing about right now, Anjana? I guess I'm still building that pipeline, but um, you know, I wasn't quite sure if I go in and ask for some advice and then the pitch um, or how to approach it, because obviously I don't want to sort of close that door. I want to kind of keep it open. Um, so that's the thing that I've been kind of toying in my mind. And the people that are the C-suite levels, are you, are you recruiting C-suite positions also? Uh, no, um, it would be sort of um, senior level um, accounting positions um, that we're currently focused on recruiting. Um, and they're obviously, you know, in positions where they're looking to build out a team or they can sort of provide introductions to, you know, their network. So it was just, you know, how do I sort of take a, so you know, soft approach? Well, I will tell you this, the next session I'm doing for you all is called the One Call Placement. It's on marketing candidates. Oh, because if we, or, and remember those five paths that I talked about, the bottom one, cold calls, there's two exceptions for that. One exception is if I'm calling to interview you for an article that I'm writing for a trade association, you could do that. You could find a trade association within, let's say you work accounting and finance within manufacturing companies or within healthcare, whatever that vertical niche is. You could contact that trade association. I'd like to write an article on this. And now that's a reason to call people up and interview them. The other reason, the other exception to cold calls working is when you're calling to solve an immediate problem. For example, Anjana, if you and I started a fire extinguisher company business and we're driving in downtown Dallas, I'm driving the fire truck and you've got the binoculars and you're looking, oh, Scott, there's a fire. I see a fire in that building. Let's drive up to it. Oh, it's on the third floor. Call the CEO. You call him up. I'm with the Love and Patel fire extinguisher company and we're selling fire extinguishers. And I notice you have the fire on the third, fourth or fifth floor. We're in the neighborhood. Are you open to looking at some of our fire extinguishers? Absolutely. How soon can you get here? And that's what I'm going to talk about on the next session. 
Up until that time, if you don't have anybody you could market and you're going to reach out to them, a third strategy you could say is in the course of developing this niche, I've come across a handful of exceptional candidates that are not actively on the market. But they've told me that if there was a significant opportunity, that I should reach out to them and tell them about that and see if they'd like to interview. So that could be one way you could do that. Outside of everything that I covered today, that could be another solution. In the, in the course of developing my practice, I've come across a handful of some very talented individuals. And these are people that I believe would make a move if it was the right sort of opportunity. In doing research on your company, I believe that there are some unique points of distinction that could be attractive to these professionals. So I wanted to call and make an introduction and see if you're open to that kind of a conversation. So I would do it that way. That's how I would finesse it. It sounds a lot better than I've got some people. You want to pay me a fee for them or what? It sounds a lot better than that. <laughs> hey, Scott, I just wanted to make a comment. Thank you for today. I think it was um, very beneficial to everyone. One thing I wanted to share, as Evelyn shared, she's been here nine months. We have a lot of recruiters who are new um, and start in this industry without any background in recruiting. So we do need to make cold calls to some degree because there's no, there's no clientele, there's no base. And so what we really focus on, and I'm so glad you brought up in the next session, NPC calls. It's a lot of marketing candidates to build that bench. Yeah, in that next session, I'm gonna give you a model that's pretty much plug and play, where it's gonna work for you and exactly what to say, how are the clients thinking when you reach out to them. And it's done in a, in a professional way, where it's not like you're calling to sell them. Remember, they need you more than you need them. So thank you, Karen. I appreciate that input. Absolutely. Thank you. Great, great. information. See you guys next time. Have a great okay. day. Thank Bye. you, Scott. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you, Scott. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye.